Okay, welcome to the faculty panel, and here's where you get to uh, ask questions that you aren't able to ask because we all ran over time in our lectures. Uh, but we'll start with a number of questions. Well, if you have questions, you can raise your hand, but I'll start with a few of questions that were um, written before and submitted. So uh, the first question we have here is, I understand how prices are not determined by input costs, but do input, do input costs create a price floor? I guess meaning uh, a, floor be which, a floor below which uh, prices cannot fall for some reason. Not a government price floor. Does anyone want to take a shot at that? I'm not basically a microeconomist, but I'll, answer, I'll try to answer that question. <laughs> that, the, that the floor would be, what are they worth in some other uh, area? Uh, if it's an input, it could be an input to several different things. And, and uh, if it's also going to, to some other uh, production process, then, then that would put a floor on it for some given production process. Yeah, I would also say that when you have consumer goods that are already produced, there is no floor. It's, uh, if the uh, seller cannot use the good, then, then the, the price can fall to zero. We all know that with leftover automobiles, um, that is, automobiles that will depreciate because the model year has ended, that uh, dealers will sell them for much below sticker price and sometimes actually below the, the cost of production. Okay, um, GM was forced to do this. Uh, in the, um, I think it was the late 80s, and then, then again during the financial crisis. That's how you lose money, okay? In other words, the, the, in, past input costs that were sunk into producing this good that's available today have absolutely no bearing on what price is set today. Uh, one thing that would add to this is that we need to separate out kind of equilibrium style reasoning with an evenly rotating economy from what um, Dr. Slander was just talking about. Because it's certainly true I might overproduce one year, not have any use for it at the end of the model year and be willing to give it away for pennies, um, but at the same time this would not be something we'd expect year after year after year in an evenly rotating economy. Right, so in some sense, in an evenly rotating economy, the question, the answer gets closer to yes, right, in the sense that then we're just bound by the value and other uses. Okay. Uh, why is government spending considered waste? In Rothbard's writings, bureaucrat, bureaucrats' wages are waste, and, in, and uh, quote, investment is, is, is waste. Uh, I get that some of it, I understand that some of it's waste, but some of it probably needed to be done if lower on value scales. Also, I never got the, if, and Rothbard does say this, I remember, if at least 50% is wasted, government wastes 50% of the tax monies and, uh, that it takes in, um, why must the, the uh, t all be written off as a total waste? So what, what I think, what, in, in the, la the last part I'll answer, Rothbard means there is that government adds no net value. So if it, if it takes $2,000 that would have been used to produce goods and services in the, in the private sector and wastes thousands of, of that and, and produces something for 1000 the net benefit from the government is zero. But the, anyone have an answer to the first part about Rothbard's uh, bureaucratic wages are waste? It's not just Rothbard that says that. I know David uh, Friedman has that in his book, that, that, that uh, on average, uh, all government spending is waste. But that takes into account the, the parts of government spending that do, do a whole lot of harm. <laughs> yeah. It'd be negative value, uh, big time. And that, and that averages in with uh, some of these things that are worth about 50% of what they had to be paid for. Also, uh, with government investment, I mean, sure, some of it can be can be integrated into the structure of production, and some of it surely is. I mean, obviously, shippers use railroads, and, and they use roads that are built. Um, but 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 their, their value, their capital value, 
such as it is, is far below uh, what, what it invested in, in, into, into those resources. So Rothbard, somewhere he kind of fudges and says, well, you know, some, we, we can't know what the actual value is. Some of it is useful, okay? And it's not because, it's, I think the, the writer puts here, that some of it needed to be done. That doesn't matter, that some of it needed to be done. Uh, the question is how valuable is what is done? Okay, compared to the resource, what, what the resources could have produced uh, of other things that needed to be done. Yeah, I wanted to add that I think these kinds of statements can be misleading uh, or, or easily misinterpreted because there's a difference between, you know, what might be a praxeological definition of waste and a common sense definition of waste. I mean, what, what Rothbard means in that context is not just, you know, useless stuff that's sitting around garbage you know, flies swarming around it, or trash, or whatever. No, I mean, something could be, you could have a good or service that, had it been produced on the market, and were it integrated into the structure of production, uh, were it produced in accordance with consumer wishes and so forth, would add value. I mean, that same physical object would be waste in an economic sense if it comes into existence outside of the market mechanism and is not integrated into the structure of the market and so on. Okay, here's a, a theoretical question. Could you talk about the uh, issue of expectations for um, Austrian economics and also about the relationship with time preference theory? So the question is about expectations and then its relationship with time preference theory. Right, yeah, expectations. I think the reason that it's so nebulous in the Austrian view is that we understand that realistically that expectations are in, in fact basically nebulous and that they're all subjective. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And the way that I form expectations is very personal to me. Um, and since we're not really that interested in a lot of mathematical modeling, we don't have to be more precise most of the time. Whereas in the more mainstream view, you have to define exactly how expectations are going to be formed um, in some mathematically useful way, if then they're going to have any impact inside of the mathematical model. Right. And so I think there's a reason that they're nebulous. Um, but at the same time, we do see Austrians you know, speculating about how expectations may work. Right. So maybe people are looking, and you see this very clearly in, um, say, the regression theorem. How do I form expectations about money is going to be worth in the future? Well, I look at what money was worth in the past. Right? And, and there is underlying this a theory of expectations. Right? So we do see it in there, but for the most part, you're right that it is very nebulous. Right? And I think it's because it's realistic. <laughs> Let me add to that that um, if you read Mises' account of hyperinflation and, and the, the run-up to hyperinflation, you find that there's a number of theories of, of expectations embedded in there, the, 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 and, and they're not praxeological. It's really, um, uh, the word is, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Yeah, th thymological. That is, it's based on human psychology. So initially, during World War I, people had um, long experience with the gold standard. So that when prices rose during World War I, people, people's, elastic, uh, people's expectations were completely inelastic. They believed that after the war was over, after this emergency, those prices were going to go back to their normal level before the war. So expectations were sort of static. They didn't believe that what was currently happening had any bearing on what was going to happen in the future. And then the, se the second step was when they became adaptive, when after the war ended and, and prices continued to rise, people began to realize that, look, prices are going to continue to rise into the future. So they expected this, the, the, this rise in prices. And that's when people began to shift out of cash and, and began to, to look for inflation hedges and so on. And then during the hyperinflationary period is when you, 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 we had what might be called rational expectations, but not in a strict sense, but simply that people began to expect, uh, when they saw the government increase in the money supply, prices to rise more in the future than, than they're, they're, they're currently rising. And so at that point, there was a scarcity of cash. Literally, people had bid prices up so high of goods, there wasn't enough cash to pay for those goods. So there was an evolution of expectations, and different people at the same time had different expectations. So, so speculators on foreign exchange markets had rational expectations long before industrial workers and, and especially farmers. Then industrial workers had them, and then farmers were still selling things for current prices and not 
not expecting you know a great heat up in, ex in, in inflation, and they were the last, sort of the last group, or what Marx called the uh, the rural idiots. Marx once said that capitalism saved the pop population from a, a life of rural idiocy. I think that was his, the coolest statement he made. Uh, <laughs> he did say that. Uh, one thing, uh, time preference is the rate at which you prefer a good in the present to the future, and expectations or beliefs people have about the future. So I don't see logically there's any relation between those. Now, that leaves open, even if there's no logical relation between beliefs about the future and the rate at which you prefer good in the present to good in the future, that leaves open the possibility there's some re relation between the theory you have about expectations and the theory about time preference. But if there is such a relation, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Okay. Uh, one of the solutions Rothbard has for the problem of air pollution is suing road owners. Yet Rothbard also rejects vicarious liability when a principal is responsible for the actions of his, her agent or agents. Aren't these incommensurate positions? David? Well, uh, I'm not clear what the uh, the... Pro the logical problem is supposed to be who is supposed to be the vi vicarious agent in the case of the road owner. It seems, a, seems there's a step miss, at least more one step, if not more, missing in the argument underlying that. If, if the person who wrote the question is here and wants to push that a little bit, go ahead. Yeah, Thank you. So, um, in this article, all property is in air pollution. Right. Um, he rejects vicarious liability where the employer would be responsible legally for the actions of his employees. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the solutions for uh, private road, with for uh, air pollution is with, under private road ownership is to allow uh, people to sue the road owner who would therefore be responsible for the actions of his customers. And it seems to me like that's also an instance of vicarious liability. It's not the people committing the action who are being held responsible for. But you see, the problem there is when you talk about vicarious agency, that's there's someone else who's doing the Hold tort, the who's up, intervening, and it doesn't appear there is any in this case. It's who is the one inter, uh, sort of between the road owner who's really doing the committing the tort. It isn't clear there is any such person. So I don't think the cases are at all parallel. Also, I don't know if Rothbard would say that um, he's against the liability um, of, of the employer when, when the um, employee is acting, uh, is carrying out the policy of the company itself. Maybe he rejects any sort of criminal liability that if you know the guy, mur the the rug cleaner guy murders the household holder who hired them, something like that, he would reject that certainly. Um, but that's I'm not I'm not sure of that, but I think that's that's what he means. Okay, um, is there a use for the methods of neoclassical economics outside of praxeology? Is the conflict between Austrians and other schools? purely on how they d um, define economics, economic law versus economic tendency, or economic law slash economic tendency, excuse me. I'm not sure if this is exactly what uh, the questioner has in mind, but uh, you know, uh, within the Austrian school, there exists a range of views, for example, on how to use quantitative methods in doing economic history, you know, as part of thymology. You know, is it useful to run a linear regression if you're trying to explain, you know, at what was the precise influence of, you know, uh, agricultural commodity prices on migration patterns in the Western United States in the 1920s or something? Um, you know, I, I don't. I don't think there's anything in Austrian methodology per se that would rule out 
you know, running an OLS regression or some other kind of regression to try to analyze that question as a matter of economic history. Now, the regression might might per se be inappropriate because it's the you know wrong kind of specification or whatever. It might not be properly done. The data might be la might not be uh, precisely collected. The analysis might not be correctly interpreted. So it could be badly done. But I don't think that there's any praxeological reason to say that such techniques would be per se illegitimate in trying to understand particular patterns in the data of the past. Is the person who asked the question here? Is that what you had in mind? Is that what you had in mind? Okay. Uh, can you discuss Dr. Hulsman's critique of pure time preference theory? Uh, if a larger stock of a future good is preferred to a smaller stock of a present good, uh, then that means we can consider stocks of goods existing in different time periods, in different periods of time, excuse me, as homogeneous. Holzman would say a good in the present is a different good than the good in the future. I'm not sure. Do you, do you yeah, know I, Go ahead. Sure. Uh, yeah, so we, we talked a little bit about, about this in a uh, lecture on the time preference theory of interest. So um, that is, that's a fairly accurate statement of uh, Guido's view. Um, and so he says, you know, his conclusion is that uh, we can't then say that um, time preference operates to give us a uh, logically certain premium of the present because the present good is, in this view, a different good than the good in the future. Its intertemporal placement makes it a distinct good, just like its geographic placement would make it a distinct good. That's sort of the analogy that's used. Uh, the criticism that I uh, uh, bring against uh, this this point, I don't disagree with the the argument he's making. I just think it uh, is beside the point. Um, and uh, my argument relies on Frank Fetter's insistence that um, uh, when when the interest rate is determined by exchange in markets, it's never an in kind trade. We never trade goods in the present for goods in the future. We always trade money in the present for money in the future. And Fetter goes on to uh, claim that money in the present and money in the future, uh, are, uh, the units of money in the present and the units of money in the future are in fact homogeneous. They're not different goods. The, 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 we have a homogeneous unit of economic calculation that we can use both intertemporally and you know, across geographic regions and across all the goods that we trade for and so on. So, so, so I don't think Guido's argument is wrong. I, I just think it's sort of beside the point. And uh, it's understandable that he, he uh, brings this argument forward because in the writing of Mises and uh, Rothbard, the, 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 they seem to interchangeably define time preference first in terms of satisfaction, a present satisfaction is preferred to the same satisfaction in the future, and in terms of goods. And uh, I think it's just a semantic uh, error to do that. So. Yeah, and let me just add that, that Mises always said that uh, the pl placement of money in space doesn't change its nature. They're not different goods. Uh, and that's why the purchasing power parity theorem holds. David Gordon, could you explain what the... <laughs> <laughs> it says, yeah. Could you explain what the hermeneutical debate was all about, and what was at stake? Uh, there was a group of Austrian economists, Don Lavoy was one of them most known, who thought that uh, hermeneutics, which is a particular kind of interpretation theory, especially developed by some of the German philosophers like Wilhelm Dilthey and later uh, Hans Gadamer would be of use in Austrian economics. And hermeneutics, as those philosophers wrote about, was a method of interpreting texts. And so uh, they, they uh, Lavoy thought that uh, this was in a way similar to what the Austrian economists were doing in 
trying to understand particular human actions. We were kind of interpreting what people were doing. And it tended, in Rothbard's view, to lead to a uh, not giving adequate place to economic theory. It was rather reducing economic theory just to a specific understanding of Rishdayan of particular events and the neglected the role of theory. Uh, some people find, I mean, I think you can read Gadamer's work if you want. I never got all that much out of it, but that just no doubt reflects my own deficiencies. But I never, I never thought that uh, the people who favored that were ever, were ever able to come up with anything that they'd gotten from hermeneutics that was supposed to be helpful to economic theory. I, uh, it, it's an interesting claim, but one would like to see what is it they're supposed to, what did they come up with using that that they would have been a, unable to come up with without it. That's a hermeneutical question that's yet unanswered. All right. Uh, you have been appointed as the new financial minister of Greece. How do you bring your country to prosperity, and what policies and precedents will be enacted that will keep your country prosperous for the foreseeable future? Does anybody want to take a shot at that? <laughs> well, I, I would, I would, re <laughs> I would repudiate the debt, uh, the sovereign debt. That is, I, I would not continue to burden the Greek people with the, the failed policies of the past, the borrowings from the past. And that would initially at least shut Greece out of the um, markets, uh, capital markets, the Greek government, which I think would be a good thing. And may, maybe, maybe their businesses for a while, uh, which I think would be a good thing because then they couldn't run, run deficits, which means that the next step would be so to take a, a meat ax approach to cutting spending. In other words, um, and, and President Reagan had a chance of doing this when uh, in the early 1980s, when he was talking about cutting spending, he was only talking about cutting it for um, social programs. But what he could, you know, and he, and, and he said we were, in, we were coming out of a terrible de recession at the time. Um, so of course, was, that, was it 82 when he was? No, 80. 80, okay. So we're in the midst of a terrible recession at the time. Uh, a double dip recession that lasted until 82. What he could have done was to say, look, um, we're not just going to cut social programs. We're going to cut spending across the board, including the, the military. And there were plans out there that, that, that said things like this. So we're going to, you know, so, so, so you won't, no, no one is going to, no one's going to have their ox gored uh, while someone else is sort of living high off the hog. So everybody would, would, would take a huge 20% cut. So, so I, I think as the finance minister, you would, you would just cut spending and, um, down to, to, to the level of taxes, get rid of the, the, the deficit. You would have to get rid of the deficit. Nobody's going to buy your debt. And, and, and I think that's the, the first two steps. Um, raising taxes would be off, off, the, you know, off the table. I wouldn't, wouldn't do that. Uh, and then possibly uh, uh, tying the, 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 the Greek currency to the euro, but, but not formally, okay? Maybe through a, a currency board or even maybe introducing the euro, which is called euroization or dollarization, but, um, allow, but, but allowing banks, taking all regulations off banks and allowing the, the, them to fail so that um, you would have a tight rein on, on monetary expansion, okay, with, with, a, with a true free banking system. So I, I think, I mean, it's, that's very difficult, it's politically probably impossible, but I mean, that's what I would push for. Does anyone else have any other? If, if, if this fantasy does yeah, not, you know, if there are no political constraints or yeah. whatever, I mean, aside from the things that Joe mentioned, I mean, you would have to restructure the Greek economy, right? I mean, public sector workers have to be laid off. Um, na industries that are nationalized, you know, have to be privatized. I mean, uh, uh, all of us probably in the room would agree on, you know, a, a set of things that the Greek government currently does in terms of economic policy that it should not be doing. I mean, it's, it's no great mystery, uh, sort of in the abstract, 
how you would make economic performance better than it otherwise would, although the, question, the way the question was written, you know, I can't remember, what would guarantee prosperity? Well, I mean, nothing is guaranteed, right? It depends on what Greek entrepreneurs and consumers and capitalists want to do. But uh, you could, you know, the issue with Greece is really just, it's a political institutional issue, you know, what will people put up with? What kinds of decisions are, you know, politically feasible? I mean, of course, you know, the, 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 the word austerity is just nonsensical how that word is tossed about. I mean, there's never been anything remotely resembling austerity in Greece or anywhere in Europe. I mean, what we would all presumably want is actual austerity, right? I mean, actual spending cuts, as Joe mentioned, repudiating the debt, sh shrinking the extremely bloated public sector. You know, what do you do with all these public sector pensions? Do you repudiate those right away? Do you phase them out? You know, do, do you convert them somehow into private assets? I mean, I don't know exactly, but um, I know that ideally, of course, you would want all of that to be in the private sector. Well, let me say, the, the European Parliament or the European Central Bank is stopping Greece out because it seems like Greece has no incentive to mm. fix anything because they keep getting bailed out. The, like the, the parliament and the ECB keep saying, no, we're not going to bail you out. You can do this, but they don't do it. And, but they keep getting money, they keep getting money. And so what is going to take to this, this to stop or to never stop until like, the whole world, like the world, fails? The Greeks aren't being bailed out. It's the holders of the debt that are being bailed out, and that's the problem. So the you know the the, the Greeks are just kind of the intermediary, <laughs> and so yeah. The the I saw this piece. Um, I don't remember now where it was. Financial Times or someplace where they showed the transition of the holders of the Greek debt since the crisis hit, and there's been a movement away from the uh, what we might consider the elite holders. You know the Goldman Sachs and the big banks and the you know the power broker moneyed uh, interests, so to speak. And I, I think it's been moving, if I recall the the graphic correctly, it's been moving into the hands of uh, well, I guess we call them public institutions, uh, the ECB, uh, the uh, IMF. I think it increased its share and so on. So right. So once the debt gets into their hands, then I think. <laughs> repudiation, right? Repudiation doesn't hurt the yeah. the political uh, the interests, right? At that point, but uh, but I, so I think that's uh, something to think about. Does yeah. economics any value with Austrian economics, and is there an Austrian critique on using comparative statics? No, I think uh, um, comparative statics does have a use use in Austrian economics. And when we teach money, for example, we talk about an increase in the money supply in a neutral way. That is, what, what, what's the, if the money supply doubles, what's the effect on the purchasing power of money when we introduce that topic? Well, all prices are you know, pretty much double. The purchasing power of money is cut in half. But, we don't, but Austrians don't stop there. Uh, the Austrians then introduce the step-by-step, -step, what means is called the step-by-step -step analysis by which you go from one state to the next. And in fact, the, the, the state that actually emerges in the real world, uh, or even in a world in which you hold everything else constant except the change in the money supply and go step by step, uh, is, is quite different from, from uh, sort of the neutral money world of comparative statics. And that is that as, as new money is introduced into the economy, it's introduced at certain points. People have certain value scales that differ from one another. They begin to spend on certain goods and drive the price of certain goods up and other goods down. There's permanent redistributions of wealth and income so that at, at the end of the whole process, if you could really hold everything constant, you'll find that th there'll be a, a, what has it called a revolution in the price structure. So, so, so people who uh, are in fixed incomes will have lower real incomes and, and, and less real wealth uh, so that the prices of, let's say, condos in Florida will be permanently lower but the prices of fancy um, Napa Valley wines will be higher because these are the people that got the new money first, and so on. So um, comparative statics can be abused uh, and has to be supplemented 
by well, what we sometimes call a period analysis, the Swedes call the period analysis, or process analysis, or Mises just called step-by-step -step analysis. But does anyone want to add to that? Yeah. Uh, this question about the correlations and so on in, in um, econometrics, um, it gets abused a lot by the mainstream theorists uh, in, in going directly from correlations to cause and effect relationships. Uh, there's an interesting uh, interview by Dan Hammond of Wake Forest, of Milton Friedman, multi years ago, I can't think when, when it was. 87, 89. It's in the 80s, yeah. yeah. And at one critical point, uh, Dan Hammond, who was actually a classmate of mine at University of Virginia, uh -huh. uh, asked Friedman, so your theory isn't a causal theory. That was a that was the question. He, uh, and Friedman essentially said, I don't understand the question. Uh, and then he went on to say that uh, cause, this is a direct quote, he says, cause is a tricky word. And he says, I avoid using it. <laughs> and instead, uh, he'll say something like, of course, I mean, correlation is about the best, the, the only thing you could say. But he'll say that, you know, A explains B, which which really just means it correlates with B. Uh, and, and so it's still not clear what's, which is explaining which. Uh, but uh, it, it was, it's an interesting uh, interview because it kept going on and on uh, with, with uh, Friedman Saying that he, he doesn't use the word cause, and then and then Hammond indicated some uh, article that he'd written that he did use the word cause. He said, well, he, "Let me correct this." He said, uh, "When I write for the general public, I use the word cause; otherwise, I'd, it might confuse them. But if I'm doing scientific writing, uh, better not because it's it's just too tri tricky a concept." Well, of course, Austrian theory is very causal, causal genetic theory. Uh, and so they they <laughs> embrace that word, and if and if they can't say something uh, in in the realm of causality when they're trying to figure out what's going on in the world, then they just haven't done their job. Uh, I wanted to just say uh, uh, one thing about uh, this uh, topic uh, that uh, concerns a previous question about. Something about the like the relationship between the Austrian uh, body of uh, economics and uh, mainstream. You know, uh, both the mainstream and the Austrians do comparative analysis, as uh, Joe was describing it. Um, but it's very hard to do process sort of uh, analysis within an equilibrium modeling approach. So, so there's one sense in which uh, to think about this relationship between the two. Uh, different uh, approaches to economics, that, that the Austrian approach really uh, takes what uh, can be learned from the neoclassical approach and augments it with further developed uh, procedures of, of analysis. It's really, uh, d in one sense, more robust than as, a, uh, as an approach uh, than the neoclassical. Okay, uh, if a successful entrepreneur in fractional reserve banking accounts his expanded liabilities through a line of credit, um, which he is rarely forced to draw upon and pay interest, how may his business be legally assessed? Is his business model necessarily inflationary or fraudulent? So I guess what you're saying here is that he extends lines of credit that aren't always used. Um, and so how would you account for this? Would you, would you consider this? Uh, we're not going to uh, uh, address the issue of fraud. Uh, There's really theory and method, and that's really ethics. Um, but but is, is it inflationary? Are, are lines of credit inflationary? To the extent that they're used, they, they, they do um, introduce more um, money into, into the economy, or money substitutes into the economy. Um, they're used, they're drawn on by writing a check. So they, they instantaneously come into existence at, at that point. Also, by extending them, you would decrease the uh, demand for money proper. 
since people would have these lines of credit backing them up, and that would that would affect the uh, demand for money, would lower the demand for money and raise prices. Um, but anyone else have any insights on that? Okay. All right, that's the last written question that we have. Um, oh, this is interesting. So this is a follow-up, somewhat related. Is an all-you-can-eat buffet an illegitimate contract? And I'm no, no. I, I, I think someone else asked me this. And assuming that that there's a chance that they could run out of food, while people are have already paid and are there. So that's an interesting thing to think. About. Yeah. It reminds me of a, a line yeah. from The Simpsons where the uh, the uh, the attorney character Lionel Hutz says he's going to sue Disney or whatever for uh, their film, The Never-Ending Story. You know, which, <laughs> <laughs> literally an all-you-can-eat a contract which guarantees all-you-can-eat for all customers at all times could not, in fact, be fulfilled, right? But I think it's a social convention. There's also the joke about the guy who goes to an all-you-can-eat restaurant and he goes up to get a second plate and the proprietor says, nope, that's all you can eat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we'll open the floor for uh, any questions. Can I throw your hand first? Just stand up so we can hear you. Um, so I was the question about complexity theory. Um, okay. I think it can be, be asked pretty clearly without a really understanding of it. All right, go ahead. Okay, so... Um, if you think about like my body is composed entirely of chemicals at, at a certain level, but you would have a very difficult time explaining my digestive processes through only chemical principles alone. In other words, in terms of like valence electron shells, it'd be very difficult to explain my, my physiology. Uh, so the idea here is that you have to, once systems become sufficiently large, move to a larger uh, unit of analysis. So the idea here is that once an economy gets sufficiently large, can phenomena emerge that are no longer explicable in terms of methodological individualism? And it wouldn't in any way invalidate praxeology any more than physiology invalidates chemistry, but the idea is that it opens the door for a, a new methodology for macroeconomics. Well, it's an interesting question. You see, I'm inclined to think you're, it's certainly possible that new phenomena emerge at a certain level, but it's not guaranteed that they will. So I don't think that uh, one could say that there, there, it could happen that there are new phenomena that, that emerge, but I mean, just from the fact that one reaches a certain level of complexity, I don't think this would require new laws. On the specific one you asked was, could this show methodological individualism no longer applies? Well, remember, methodological individualism is principle only individual, only persons act. And I can't see how just getting some, some complex system could make it the case that something other than an individual could act that I'm not really clear on the meaning of that. Maybe what you have in mind is more like uh, something like this. Um, when we have, when we move from a household economy or uh, you know, tribal economies to advanced divisions of labor economies, and we want to do analysis of those economies, we, we do have to create constructs of analysis that we don't need for simple situations of acting. Uh, uh, so we, we do uh, like... Uh, uh, the, the stages of production, you know, when Rothbard uh, creates these stages of production for the complex economy and man economy and state, these are, you know, sort of <laughs> difficult abstractions that, that have, you know, properties to them that are, uh, we have to think about the nuances of if we want to work out all the logic of, of the development of them, that, that we wouldn't need uh, when we're doing analysis of, you know, uh, Caruso, we do have stages of production, but there it's micro, right? We can see exactly what Caruso's doing to, you know, make his net and catch his fish. Whereas here we're talking about, you know, extraction industries as a whole or, you know, lower stage, one lower stage as a whole and so on. So, so it might be that uh, 
you know, I don't think it contradicts methodological individualism, but I, I do think it's a new, it's kind of a new approach of theorizing or a new, or a development. It's a augmentation of, of our body of theory that we wouldn't need for simple situations. It's kind of what comes to mind, um, especially as you mentioned macroeconomics, is kind of the way that micro and macro were treated for a long time in the mainstream from about the 1930s till about the 70s, where there was this big separation, right? We had the micro side and the macro side were treated totally differently. Um, but then we found in the 1970s, it really didn't work on the macro side. And there was a huge revolution in the mainstream um, for exploring what we now call the micro foundations of macro, right? Where we need to reintroduce these microeconomic concepts. Um, and I think the analogy is a fairly good one between biology and chemistry. Right? If we're trying to do something in biology and we just ignore the chemistry, we might still be okay. But if what we're doing is totally inconsistent with the underlying chemical movements that are happening, then we're going to be wrongheaded. Right? Right? So might it be okay by a shorthand right, to adopt different methods, perhaps, right? but those should in the end be consistent with whatever methodological individualism tells us. Right? And I think we found that in the mainstream, and I think we'd agree that that's a good path. Oh, and also, um, I, I uh, talk to a lot of uh, sociologists and sort of organization theorists who come from a sociological perspective. A lot of them think that they reject methodological individualism in their work when they really don't. In other words, methodological individualism, as the name suggests, is a methodological statement, not an ontological statement. In other words, when we refer... When we use praxeology in the senses that we're describing, we're not saying that higher level phenomena don't exist. We're just saying that we, we cannot explain these particular patterns that we're interested in without reference to the actions and you know the beliefs and the value scales and the actions of specific individuals. So a good example would be culture. You know, I think there is such a thing as you know American culture that might be distinct from Chinese culture, or I think that you know the sort of the organizational routines at Apple are different in some way from the organizational routines at you know General Motors. But I don't think I can explain why Apple is more profitable than General Motors by saying, well, it has a better culture, right? I mean, it may, it may be that there that that there are different cultures, but that's not a principle of, that does not explain outcomes. I can't explain outcomes without reference to individuals from the point of view of praxeology. So we might agree with you that in a highly complex economy, there are some phenomena that are difficult to reduce to the actions of individuals, but we, we could not then use those phenomena to explain different causal processes or outcomes or relationships among different parts of the economy. Uh, and let me, uh, well, let me take another question. I saw your hand first. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, with the big increases in computing power, I feel like mainstream economics is, you know, going more toward, uh, you know, big, big Excel sheets, things like that, big databases. Um, it seems to me that this could be a, like a strategic um, Thing that the Austrian school can kind of move toward, uh, now that we have this computing power, moving away from aggregates into more uh, heterogeneous uh, studies like that. Is it, is it not that simple, or? This is not really- In answer to your question, but uh, it relates to it, uh, Rothbard wrote a short article on complexity theory. Um, I forget where it's been, which collection, it's chaos theory. And it, it, was it was. I mean, he he he. This was back when. Uh, what was that? What was the book uh, by G James Gleick? I think on chaos, chaos was on the New York Times bestseller yeah. list, and everybody was talking about talking about Mandelbro sets and fractals and so on. And Rothbard was sort of fa he was sort of intrigued by this. He said the development of this kind of mathematical analysis, you know, makes people more skeptical about the conventional kind of econometric approaches and that this might be a useful tool to show some of the defects in conventional mathematical economics. So by analogy, it may be that some of the techniques, you know, in sort of big data analysis are things that we could use to kind of demonstrate uh, the flaws in other kinds of quantitative methods, you know, to what extent uh, 
Austrian economists doing thymology would want to use these very inductive techniques. I don't know, but maybe we would find them useful in doing economic history. Run out of time. Um, you have a 15 minute break, and then um, you can go downstairs and go to the uh, theory and policy, or rather, the what is it? Policy, history and policy um, seminar. <laughs>